Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, it's Winning Beyond COVID-19. Uh, my name is Richard Olson, and I'll introduce you to Michael Wright, who will take us through the first half of the presentation, and then on to Andy Coton. Um, so, I just talked through um, a little bit about us. So, um, we are an advisory service providing real support to businesses on the ground um, following the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are fully funded by the Peterborough and Cambridge Combined Authority, as well as the Business Board, and we have local partnerships with the likes of the Cambridgeshire Chambers of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, Institute Directors, Met UK, etc., as well as all the other local councils and business networks. We have a team of business advisors uh, with a wide range of knowledges uh, of industries, rather, with a variety of skills covering uh, HR, mental health, finance, marketing, export, import, uh, business planning, supply chain, IP, R&D, etc. And we're running a series of webinars. Uh, this is our eighth webinar we've run so far. Um, and we're running a series of webinars. Uh, our next one is on Thursday of this week, which is talking about returning to work in a safe environment. And we have another one the following Thursday, which is on operating efficiencies post COVID-19. So how to improve your operating efficiencies. Uh, in addition to that, we also offer uh, free one-to-one -one, uh, advice to businesses who are either returning to work, who are continuing to work during this uh, troubling times, and that is available. And I'll go into details about that in the end. So without further ado, and prior to the court of practice starting again, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Michael Wright. Good morning, uh, and thanks from me to everybody for attending this morning. Uh, as Rich said, uh, our webinar is entitled Winning Beyond COVID. Um, our webinars to this point are very much focused on the here and now, aimed to provide help to really survive the current crisis and the business conditions created by it. The focus here, though, is a little bit more about future success. Um, our objective is to provide positive guidance on how to emerge stronger, more competitive, and more commercially successful uh, when our businesses resume trading uh, and get back to the new normal. Uh, we, if we can go back, uh, Rich, to the uh, agenda slide. Thank you. So the, uh, the way we're going to do this, um, uh, we'll start out with Andy talking through business planning. Uh, and he will explore areas of the business across the financial, organizational, and operational parameters to really ensure that we're driving efficiency uh, and maximize commercial uh, success going forward. And then specifically in section two, are we talking about business development going on the offensive? And the idea that we can take the time to think about our marketing, our value proposition, and, and most specifically our sales development pipeline as we, as we re-emerge uh, and look to build our revenue and our profits. In section three, we've actually developed a, a template uh, that covers all the areas of the webinar, which is for you to use to tailor these thoughts to, into actions in the short, medium, and longer term for your business across all the areas we're going to be covering. And finally, we'll touch on uh, the all important communication so that any changes you do choose to make uh, can be successfully uh, partnered with by your customers, your suppliers, and your employees. So section one uh, is Andy with Business Planning. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, uh, just want to uh, go through a few uh, steps which um, will hopefully sort of uh, uh, help business leaders, um, uh, business owners to just really prompt them uh, at this sort of difficult time. And I think that even though uh, there isn't any argument from anybody that uh, the last uh, eight or 10 weeks has been incredibly difficult, I think the opportunity that comes from us uh, from this is, is that it gives us opportunity to, to sort of stop and just pause for a moment and have a look at our business plan that we've currently had. Because uh, our guess is that probably the vast majority of businesses will be slightly different going forward than they were pre-lockdown. So that even though every business is different, um, there are some, some sort of key prompts um, that we're just gonna go through over the next uh, uh, hour. So in terms of first things first, which is really um, 
uh, having a look at cash flow and uh, and headroom. Um, as a as a business owner or business leader, uh, cash is king, and there's never been uh, a, a more important time for everybody to look at the cash within their business. Some businesses uh, run their uh, cash flow off their current account st statement. Some of them need to look um, 52 weeks or even 104 weeks ahead. But I think it's a really good discipline for us all to sort of start to look at our business in, in, in sort of four, 12 and 52 week chunks. And, th and there will be some businesses that, uh, uh, that are running um, that probably need to go down to weekly and even, even daily uh, cash flow to make sure that uh, we're not about to hit an iceberg. And the reason, the reason I say this is because none of us or very few of us have had a situation where our businesses have had to take such a long pause. And one of the key challenges we're going to be is when we come around to restarting our business is the ability in certain sectors to the cash that's going to be required to build stock. And um, that. Is, is something that we've not really had to do for probably many years from the from the day that we started our businesses, but it's going to it's going to happen to us all at some stage, and therefore, hence why cash flow um, is a good discipline um, uh, looking forward, and there's never been more of a critical time. And there are a number of uh, other points that can pop out of uh, th this subject: uh, invoice financing. Uh, I'm surprised at uh, how how few few companies actually have a look at invoice financing as a way to improve their uh, cash position. I think also um, there's a question that we should all ask ourselves is, is the bank that we've got at the moment, the bank that's going to suit our business going forward? Uh, because even though there's um, a lot of uh, help out there at the moment, uh, our guess is, is that over the coming weeks and months, that there will be some toughing up of, um, uh, disciplines required from uh, from the banks and we just need to make sure that uh, we have got a partner that's going to help us uh, work work through. Uh, F FX has been uh, an area that uh, uh, for some businesses has been um, quite a challenge over the last uh, three months. We've probably never, well we haven't seen the uh, a foreign exchange moves quite as much since the uh, Brexit um, uh, vote happened um, a few years ago. And therefore, f uh, foreign exchange planning going forward, especially for your restart, I think is going to be re really important. Also, in terms of government help, um, th we've had previous webinars going through the help that's out that the government have been giving um, to uh, uh, see us through this uh, difficult position. But there are um, other uh, help um, mechanisms out there from the government that are still there that should probably be looked at um, such things as R&D tax credits as an example where uh, people have seen this as quite a laborious process and a long-winded way of getting cash back into your business but I've um, seen uh, a number of businesses uh, very recently been able to get cash back in their businesses uh, as little as uh, five or six weeks. So I think that's definitely worth looking at. There's the capital growth scheme um, through the Cambridge and uh, Peterborough CA. So I think that's also uh, something that's worth looking at. And I think most people are, are very aware of the VAT rates uh, and tax repayment delays that the government has put into place. So these are all the things that uh, won't take too much time, but it's probably worth you revisiting them, even if they, you didn't think they were applicable 10 weeks ago, but they probably are now. Just want to touch on um, creditors and debtors. Um, there's going to be an incredible uh, focus on payment terms from both customers and suppliers going forward. Uh, and I think that we, we should all as businesses take this opportunity to ask the question and revisit um, sometimes what have been um, long-standing agreements with our suppliers on payment terms. And we shouldn't be shy about asking the question about, is there an improved situation for us all out there? I, I suggest that, that um, uh, our suppliers will be expecting a call. So take the opportunity to relook at your payment terms. Um, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. In terms of uh, customers, uh, 
uh, again, I think that uh, now is the time to, to, to have a look at uh, if there's an opportunity to change the terms. And I've been pleasantly surprised. I've been working with uh, two or three uh, very large retailers that have um, looked very favorably um, at uh, SMEs in terms of trying to help them through this difficult time. Some of them have had for a discount for, for early payment, but I've equally been surprised at uh, two or three, well, definitely uh, two of them haven't asked for that at all. And um, um, their, their supplies are incredibly important to them. And then finally, in terms of every part of business planning, uh, uh, let's ha we need to have a look at our budget. Um, my suggestion is, is that you put your 2020 budget and uh, nail it to the wall as a piece of fiction. We all know that whatever we set out a few weeks ago isn't probably going to happen uh, in 2020, but there are some businesses that are going to bounce back quickly. And I think that resetting a realistic budget for the coming um, 12 to 24 months is not only good business that's going to help you do your uh, cash flow, but equally, I think it's going to be a, an important tool to motivate your staff to show them that there is hope out there and there is an opportunity. So may, maybe there's two budgets. Maybe there's a, a budget that we're putting in, in terms of our in terms of our banking facility, but there's equally a stretch budget that we use for our staff. Uh, move on, Richard. So looking at uh, operational um, review. Uh, I think this is the absolutely perfect time to ask ourselves all is are we really a low cost operator? Because we need to be, unless we are going to be efficient uh, going forward, uh, the likelihood of survival um, is going to be much less. So I think that we need to go through every part of our business to make sure that uh, operationally we are in a very um, good place. So, um, when, when we come to um, reopening our business, if, if that's where you are or you're going to be, the one thing that's probably sure is, is that we're not going to open at the same efficiency level as we did when we closed. It's going to be a slow uh, return and therefore I think that we're going to be coming into, uh, we're probably going to see a number of weeks where our overall operational efficiency is going to be much less. So that begs the question is, is that if we're going to be running at 50, 60, 70% efficiency, do we really need all the overheads within the business that we've had uh, traditionally? So that's not only just people, I think it's also about uh, equipment leases, it's about contracts, and um, we should go back and talk to our suppliers on, on, on key, key overhead items to understand if there is a way that they can work with us until we get back to the optimum position. Um, shift patterns, I think also we're going to need to look at, and I'm not just talking about shift patterns for uh, factories that have got a number of hundreds of people in there. Due to the whole situation around um, safe working environments, we're going to have to look at, can we really bring everybody back to work at the same time? The, the probable answer to that is not to straight, straight away. So we need to have, have a look at that. Inventory, this is something that uh, I'm quite passionate about. I think that for those that, um, are carrying stock within their business. Um, have a realistic look at your stock position and say, do I, am I really going to um, be able to get, turn that into cash as quick as I need it to? Maybe there's a situation where you, you're looking at um, uh, reducing your expectations in terms of your, your sales price to actually create, um, to get, get some of your stock and, create, and turn it into some cash. And then so a couple of other points, energy savings. Well, why not? We've got time on our hands. Let's go out there and see if there's a, a, a lower tariff. And outsourcing. I think outsourcing is something that's going to really become a forefront of people's uh, thinking. So are there areas within our business that we can outsource just to um, look at a, a, a potentially a better, a better way of using cash within our business? Um, health and safety, HR, payroll, et cetera. Uh, there is there are there are lots of companies out there to be able to help in these these areas uh, and it's probably worth sort of sitting sitting yourself down and your team down and work out which is the best way to serve your business with some important but equally quite expensive items uh, capex um, uh, we still need to look at that in terms of uh, the way forward but just because um, we are going through a difficult time. It shouldn't mean that uh, CapEx is a, is, is a no-go. And there are a number of schemes out there to help you to, to look at that. But again, 
goes back to point one, which is the, the cash flow situation is, can, can we afford it? But equally sometimes is, can I afford not to do it? And then, and then in terms of planning, um, uh, most companies are using a, a set of KPIs and it's our guess that the, the KPIs will be slightly different going forward uh, to, to both manage the team and also to manage our business. And hopefully if we've been able to, uh, to do some of the things in the previous couple of slides, then we hopefully will have some interesting and quite exciting savings that we can monitor both on a weekly, monthly and, and an annual basis. Move on. And then finally, in terms of an organisational review, is uh, having um, run uh, a few businesses over the years, there's always a, uh, there's, there's always a reason why never to look at an organisational review. Well, now is the time to sort of stand back and actually look at your business in terms of, in terms of is it structured in the right way? We have all um, uh, mulled over in our heads a number of times about are, are we in the right place? Are we in a good position? Well, now's the time to stand back and say, is, is, is my business really uh, fit for the future? I've, I've, is it structured correctly? And what does the future hold? Also, uh, roles and responsibilities. I think that people's uh, roles are going to change within our businesses going forward. And we need to make sure that we, we're very clear in our approach to training, uh, coaching and development and, and men mentoring uh, our staff uh, return to work is going to be difficult. It's going to be emotional for a lot of people and people are going to think that they've got a completely different job to the one that they left eight or nine weeks ago. So I think it's important that it's, it's very much on the pad and, 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 and we're very good at communicating what uh, people's roles and responsibilities are. In terms of working remotely, I think working remotely is, is a, an incredibly large subject that um, we are going to uh, come back to a future webinar uh, and to do in much more depth. But I think that most of our customers, first of all, will have been very sympathetic towards the challenges that we've all had, where we've had to empty our offices and empty our factories and, and then start working from home. But the question that I'd like to pose to everybody is, are you ready for COVID too? There's, there will be one. When it is, I don't know. But I think our customers will not be as sympathetic going forward as they have been now. So we need to be ready to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we can um, switch back to where we are now um, if required in the future. And that looking at a whole host of things, which is IT capability, um, uh, what's your health and safety uh, working from home procedures? Have we got the right video and conferences um, uh, facilities in place? Um, and and can, we, can we manage and motivate our teams effectively from home going forward? And um, we'll put out a, a date um, for this area, but I think it's one that is going to become incredibly focused from both businesses, customers, but equally from, I think, from health and safety as well. And then finally, recruitment. Uh, I've just spent the last 15, 20 minutes talking about mainly cutting costs. But equally, we should um, to make sure that we stand back and say, have we got the best team? Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to uh, upgrade our teams if required and put more strength in key areas and the key areas such as um, uh, sales, uh, market, but equally in terms of buying as well. So um, uh, going through a difficult time and having such a... Um, an incredibly uh, stressful time for business leaders shouldn't stop us from looking at recruitment for our teams um, because uh, the survivors are not only going to be the efficient ones, they're going to be the people that are able to grab, grab sales and grab market share. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Andy. Uh, we're now going to move to the second section. So, so some really good pointers there from Andy on, on how to uh, increase efficiency in our business, more financial stability, uh, leaner operations, reduced overhead, uh, and so on. And, and, and now we're going to turn to, to thinking about business development specifically, uh, not just building revenue, but also building profitable growth. Uh, and we're going to do that in three ways. The first way is to think about evaluating our business proposition. Uh, and that's the rethink section. 
Uh, we'll then look at um, a, a very simple model uh, through which uh, you can build a sales pipeline and really turn sales into a process, which is something that I'm passionate about personally. Uh, and, and thirdly, we'll look at a whole series of activities that, that could be thought about now and enacted now to really kind of hit the ground running and, and emerge uh, ever stronger than before. So, so here um, is the idea that um, too often, almost always in, in our businesses, we are busy with the work of today. Uh, we're busy you know, shipping orders, we're, we're busy dealing with logistics issues, we're busy dealing with customer issues, uh, and we tend, therefore, to be quite internally focused. Uh, and and we, we, we often don't take the time to really stop and think about where our business is, how our proposal is shaped, how our customers receive it, how it compares to competitors, and, and really how we communicate that, that proposition to the market. So, so here um, is the idea that we could take the time to, to give this a bit of much needed focus. Um, so the first thing here is to think about our competition and our market. Um, through the extraordinary events of the last couple of months, it is very likely that your competitive environment will have changed. Uh, some of your competitors may have actually uh, become more innovative, uh, change their offerings, diversify their products and services, and actually become a stronger adversary. Others uh, may actually have uh, succumbed uh, or, or become weaker in, in many, many different ways. Um, so it really is a really good time to stop, think about who you're really trying to compete with uh, and how you compare. The second point is about your value proposition. Um, so this, this age old question is very relevant right now. What is your USP, your unique selling proposition? And, and the way I would characterize this is, you know, what, why do customers choose you specifically? If you had 10 seconds to describe your competitive advantage, what would you say? And when you say that, is it relevant for today? Is it informed by the competition of now? And is it appealing to your customers? And does it permeate through every aspect of your communication to market? Again, now is a great time to give this some thought, I think. Uh, building on that, in terms of commercial positioning, um, it, is it time to consider your range? Is it time to consider alliances, perhaps, between uh, supply partners or, or, or marketing partners? Is it time to think about your availability promise and, and your route to market, your pricing policy, and, and even give some thought to, to your customers. Because the reality is we all have a spectrum of customers, some good and frankly some not so good when it comes to uh, actual profit yield uh, and bottom line impact. So, so here it, it's a great time to really think about the key customers that are so passionate about your business that they become advocates and help build your revenue beyond their own spend. Thirdly, um, uh, I'm putting forward the idea that uh, it's important to have a pledge uh, and that pledge be attractive. So it could be a guarantee, it could be a service promise, it could be a commitment. But what are you saying about your value proposition uh, that, that really you stand by and, and sets you out different from others in your, in your uh, business sector? Finally, Communicate, communicate, communicate. Communication is almost everything, and, and, and this time is no different. And if you do alter any aspect of your business proposal, when you think about uh, these points, it's really important that you communicate that, those changes effectively to your audience uh, about what's new, what's different. And, and finally, um, uh, I think having done that, it's now a great time to think about a business development plan, and really trying to drive a pipeline of new sales uh, and, and new customers, really to deliver the revenue and profits that maximize the capacity that Andy spoke about uh, and really turns this new efficient business model into something that, that, that uh, drives hard in the market. So if we go to the next slide, this is um, 
uh, kind of at first glance, maybe a bit of a complicated picture, but I'll just, just talk it through. The, the, the idea here though, is that we turn sales into a simple process, something that we manage consciously and look to develop every day, week and month, rather than sales being something that, that happens to us and, and perhaps we just chase opportunities uh, in, in a homogenous way without, without scrutiny. So let's start in the middle with this upside down triangle. And this, this is really the idea that we can turn sales development into a funnel. At the top, we have leads, we have opportunities for sales, whether it's in a business to consumer or business to business setting. And however we come across uh, leads, these are any uh, occasions where we could, in theory, sell our product or service. But we need in some way to validate a lead and turn it into turn some of them into opportunities and validation could be that the customer does have a requirement for the product or service that we that we provide they do have the cash to spend on our product or service and therefore they're relevant to our business when we focus on the opportunities we then need to measure our conversion and we'll talk in a moment about the different uh, things that we can do to drive conversion but this is about um, turning an opportunity into real sales revenue, which at the next level we manage when they become customers. And here we're managing the transactional uh, efficiency, we're, we're, we're measuring uh, the quantities of products or services that they're buying, the price, the price that they pay, and the value that we get from that, that relationship. And then, logically enough, we turn to relationship management. And here we're thinking about share of wallet. So how much of the spend that the customer uh, has for our product or service do we get? Uh, are, are they, it's said another way, are they loyal to us or are we getting part of their, their, their purchase portfolio? And how do we build that numerically? But also how do we build this from a relationship point of view? We all know that people buy from people that they know and like and trust. So are we doing enough in this space to really build those customer advocates uh, on a professional and personal level to, to really, really um, ensure we've got a strong relationship for the long term. Then down the bottom, uh, we need to be analysing the revenues and the margins that we get from the product portfolio across the customers and in turn the profit that we make. And as depicted by the, the, the blue arrow on the left, this really is a process um, and we should constantly be thinking about lead generation, opportunity measurement, conversion activity, and analytics. And we can simplify this down to three core areas, build, manage, and measure. And, and I think it might be true that many of us spend most of our time in the managed space. So we're managing current customers, we're managing relationships, we're managing transactions. And the suggestion here is that we can take the time to spend uh, Put more focus into the build space, uh, looking at leads and opportunities and conversion tactics, and more in the measure space where we take a cold, hard, analytical look at the value we get from each of our customers, old and new. And, and there are um, a lot of activities that we can now consider as we look to build our, our focus uh, in this sales development process. So I'll now move to, to some of those activities and we'll, we'll talk through. Um, what they might be. So if we kind of buy into the idea that we can do more in the sales development arena and, and really think about um, build, manage and measure areas, here are, here are uh, just, just a few really um, ideas to, to think about as, as we go on the offensive. In, in, in the build space, building leads and, and opportunities, um, social media, you know, um, it's that people spend, it's analysed and said that people spend over four hours a day on their phone. So, so actually, whether, whether you're on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn is kind of secondary. The primary point is that in some form, uh, you need your business on the device they're spending so much time looking at. And, and, and on that device, you know, your messages need to entertain people, educate people and inspire people. And, and actually we can, we can use uh, social media 
with uh, the so-called short form content. So uh, images and, and, and burst messages that actually then link to perhaps our website where we can put our long form content, which is more detail about our value proposition the services that provide so we end up with a communication system where we're using social media to draw people to our website and our more detailed company information um, the advice that I hear about social media is that it should be done consistently uh, so whether it's a daily or a weekly or a monthly regime consistency uh, it triggers a lot of the algorithms that sit behind the platforms uh, and again, seek to offer a blend of image-rich, um, educational, inspiring content. So social media, really important. Next, um, going direct. Um, actually, we're seeing a bit of a trend that uh, good old-fashioned uh, letters in the post are, are proving more effective of, of late, uh, particularly this idea of, of lumpy mail. Uh, which some people describe where actually uh, you, you might put something uh, in an envelope that you send to a customer. An example I heard recently was um, sending a Kit Kat through the post along with your, your mailer um, with the idea of have a break, have a Kit Kat. Um, but, but, but direct mail, electronic or hard copy is a way uh, of, of targeting hundreds of potential customers and really getting uh, your business in front of a new gene pool. Uh, it's also an opportunity to do, say, or send something different and to experiment. Uh, and I think uh, in respect to social media, direct mail and networking, uh, all in this kind of build space, it is important to see these as experiments. Um, the networking um, topic is something that uh, many of us don't find all that appealing. It's, it's uh, perhaps not our our favorite pastime to uh, attend events and to meet new people and, and sell ourselves and our businesses. And certainly right now, um, uh, much of this, this work, this activity has taken on a different form. But the point here is that when we do re-emerge, uh, it could be a great idea to have a networking plan. Which events, associations, expos uh, will, will you look to be at or speak at or, or, or attend? And, and again, the advice here is to do three or four really well. Um, uh, we see a lot of businesses that really latch onto one network, but, but and whilst that may be beneficial, it actually puts you into the same um, community of people time and time and time again. And, and three or four uh, is said to be a, a good balance. Maybe one to do with your sector, one to do with your, your product or service, I want to do with the, the geography in which you, you operate. So maybe those are ways in which to think about three or four that you can, you can get involved with and experiment on. And, and then having done all that or, or a blend of those activities, it's really important, and this is the point about quantify and focus, to, to measure the impact. You know, uh, do we think, our, uh, and when we've measured it, are, are, are leads that turn into opportunities coming more so from social media or are they coming more from direct mail? And if so, which type of direct mail, which kind of message and or which networking community or event. So we can really uh, purposely reflect and measure and analyze the work that we've done in the build space to focus on that that has the biggest impact. Having done that, adapt and adjust. Um, it, it is uh, true, um, I think, that most businesses have a spectrum of customers. Uh, we have customers with new relationships with us and old. We have customers large and small. But actually, it might be best to think about our customers on the basis of profit and potential. Um, all too often, we can get drawn to customers that afford us the biggest revenue, but actually, when we think about the overhead consumed in serving them uh, and the margins that we make given their buying power, they may, they may, but they may not be the biggest source of profit yield. Uh, we may have other customers that when we think about them from a profit and potential perspective, really could merit uh, our effort much more. And now, again, is a great time to, to to develop 
uh, and put in place a bit of a customer segmentation model. Linked to that, winning with winners. This is back to the idea that some of our customers can become advocates. So an advocate is, in, in, in my terminology anyway, uh, a customer that not only buys our products regularly, but is a raving fan of our product or service such that they speak really positively about what we do. Uh, they, they advocate us to others in their network. It generates referrals and it builds business beyond their purchasing. And, and if we can recognize who these winners are, who these advocates could be, you know, are we, are we doing enough to personalize our service to them? Think about relationship management stuff with them uh, and, think, and think about incentives that might bring them ever, ever closer to us uh, and to build their, their advocacy yet more. Um, and finally, planning. Um, sales um, is a process like any other. And just as in manufacturing where we have we have lots of measures for, for quality and velocity, for example. We, we need measures uh, in the sales space too. And, and I guess I'll put the challenge forward that every sales person, and in small businesses, of course, we're all sales people to a certain extent, we should have a plan for every customer. We should have 2020, 2021, 2022 objectives for that customer, perhaps even broken down to quarters or months. Um, that the, the planning of a customer relationship gives the opportunity for peer learning across our team. You know, I'm doing this with this customer, it worked pretty well, here's was the outcome, why don't we try it with, with the next customer and the next customer. Um, so really this, this planning piece is a blend of customer relationship management, uh, thinking about pricing, analyzing, thinking about the margins that we make and thinking about upselling, which we see so often in the retail space, uh, but actually can be applied in, in almost any uh, customer setting. So those three areas there, win with winners, uh, adapting and adjusting and, and planning really sit for me in, in the manage space. And finally, in, in the measure space that we saw on the last slide, two points here. One, to, to take, the, take the moment to build a little bit of uh, an analytics. Um, build analytics on what our customers, uh, why our customers choose to buy from us uh, and, and the patterns of purchase. And also uh, with, with our suppliers, we, we can take customer information to drive that back into our suppliers. So whether it's a financial thing, we see competitiveness issues on a certain product or service from the customer, that's great evidence to take that back into the supply chain to try and negotiate a better purchasing deal. Or indeed, uh, if, we, if we pick up analytics from customers that there's a gap in our product or service portfolio, again, we can take that back into our, our business and think about how to serve them yet better. And the final point here is about prioritization. Um, putting, putting sales into a process really also means being dedicated to the most beneficial actions. So the resources in the business, the time expended by your people and even your own self at this moment need to be critically analyzed. And, and I, I, I really like um, the phrase, will it make the boat go faster? And this comes from uh, many years ago when, when the GB Olympic rowing team had remarkable uh, results, certainly in comparison to the Olympics four years prior. And, and as far as the public were concerned, out of nowhere, they, they, they won gold. But actually that came on the back of, of two or three years where every morning the team and their coaches would ask this question, will it make the boat go faster? You know, we'll, we'll uh, at one, one extreme, we'll go to the pub for a celebratory beer after a good training session, make the boat go faster. No, it won't, don't do it. You know, will we'll being on the, on the rowing machine uh, for an extra hour, even though it's a tortuous thing. Will that make the boat go faster? Yes, you've got to do it. And, it, and it's, a, it's a useful challenge question every morning for our own selves and our teams to really focus on the activities of the day and how they actually benefit the business going forward. 
and how all the things on this slide need to be prioritized um, for maximum impact. Okay, so so we've now we've now explored uh, with Andy's help um, em emerging with with greater uh, performance in, in the financial, operational, and organisational spaces, uh, and now we've looked at uh, sales development specifically as perhaps a discipline with many many potential activities to consider as we move forwards. What we've done here, and this is in the in the final uh, section of content here, is we've we've developed a pretty simple actually uh, checklist uh, that that comprises 20 questions um, across the four areas that we've discussed this morning financial planning operational effectiveness organizational readiness and sales development strategy uh, and these 20 questions give you the opportunity uh, to reflect on the content of this webinar and self-assess whether you're in Good shape or less good shape. Uh, the suggestion here is you can say poor, intermediate, or strong. You can choose your own descriptors, and then and then maybe to help prioritise what might be the immediate, the near term, or the longer term actions that would boost capability and performance in these really important areas. Um, and finally, we'll, we'll, we'll think about communication of these changes and, and delivery. But uh, we'll walk you through the action planner. Uh, and again, this is going to be uh, for you to use if you choose to following the webinar. So Andy will talk us through finance operations and organisation. Thanks, Michael. Um, rather than uh, just go through every single point uh, on the screen, everybody can uh, will have access to this uh, uh, afterwards. So I just wanted to pick out a couple that are probably more important um, or a, a higher priority than, uh, than the others. And of course, what are we looking to do here? We're looking to find something that is easy to do with a high return. And we're also looking to work out which, which, which part of this is important to our own business. And every, uh, going back to the very start is every business is very different. So somebody's banking facility may be much less of an issue than somebody else's um, uh, debtors and creditors position. So uh, you've really just got to... Um, uh, spend may, maybe an hour just going through the uh, slides that we're going to show you and have an honest conversation with yourself and work out exactly which position that you're in. But the two that I would uh, pick out as um, high priority uh, for the majority is really having a, a very good look at the 4, 12 and 52 week uh, cash flow position and even uh, moving that back down to, uh, to one week. And the reason I say that is because that is the absolute foundation i think of our security of our businesses going forward many other elements come into play of course uh, but unless we have the cash to survive uh, the next year then uh, then we have no business also added to, to that and this potentially could be uh, an easy to do and it could be a, a very big win is really just challenging these creditor and debtor uh, positions and ask yourself what what actually real benefit would it do to my business if I could create an extra seven or 14 days credit position? Um, so, so some businesses that could be the difference between um, survival and not equally other businesses may already have a very good position uh, in, in this area. But I, I, I would reiterate what I said earlier, which is take the time to ask yourself that question because uh, it's an incredibly uh, uh, powerful uh, position if you, uh, when going to looking for extra funding in the future, if you can make that position look as strong as possible. Move on, please. In terms of operational um, checklist, uh, a whole host of different ones. The one that we haven't mentioned uh, so far, I think, is, is, is your supply chain in great shape? Uh, we will have naturally been focusing on our own businesses and, and quite right. Uh, but uh, up and down the supply chain, we'll have uh, partners that we're working with that, have, that hopefully we've been in good, regular communication with, but will equally be um, under pressure as, as we have been. So uh, have we got a very important um, supplier or customer that we may, we may feel is going to have either be at risk or 
uh, have some challenges going forward. Uh, and also, especially for those that are, are importing product. So um, a lot of uh, listeners will be um, taking product from, from the Far East. Are we sure that the factories are still open in, in China? Uh, are we sure that actually that uh, we can now um, afford the freight? Uh, one of the customers that I'm working with at the moment is faced with a very difficult supply and demand situation on air freight. The air freight costs in, from certain parts of the world have probably gone up by 70% in the last eight weeks. Are we sure that we're in a good position to, 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 to know the answers to these questions? So um, all not difficult to do, but equally important to just check to make sure that we are on a sound footing going forward. Move on. And on the organizational uh, piece, uh, which we've spoken about, a couple of things that I want to uh, reiterate, which is the working from home strategy. Um, don't let, uh, as soon as we've got everybody back to work, don't uh, expect um, that this is going to go away forever. And also ask yourself, well, if you've been able to work from home for eight weeks and your staff have, why can't they work from home for the next 52 weeks? And um, there's, each, each business will answer that slightly different, but um, equally uh, the health and safety of your team working from home should be very front of mind at the moment. And also, are you a truly lean business? We all think that we, we run a very efficient business. Um, but this has probably highlighted a number of areas where we probably need to refocus uh, on that could be buying, that could be operational, that could be the sales part of it, that could be just the general overheads within our business. But I think it's a, a really good opportunity to just stand back and, and, and look at that. And, and, and maybe that's probably an area where some businesses might just need some, uh, some external help for somebody to come in and work alongside them to, to ask uh, ask these difficult questions on, on how you've run the business in the past and is it really fit for the future? Right. Okay, and, and, and thanks Andy. Finally, um, in the sales and marketing space, reflecting on, on the idea of sales development as a process and, and, and pipeline creation and all the activities we spoke about earlier, here are five questions that may be useful to, to really challenge your own self and your businesses um, in this space. Um, let's start with the middle one there by way of example. Um, do you actually at all or, or regularly analyze profitability across products and services and customers? You know, it, it um, sometimes we, we have um, prices for products that have evolved over time. You know, negotiations have, have turned, uh, you know, uh, standard prices into special prices that have stuck and become the new normal for that particular customer. Uh, is, your, is your pricing logical across the range now or is there opportunity for, for alteration? And, and, and a, a basic piece of analysis could, could simply be um, on, on Excel. It, it could simply be for, you know, a particular section of your customer base uh, that, that you you have a suspicion could could need a bit of bit of thought. Um, it doesn't need to be extensive. It doesn't need to be laborious, but it can be incredibly uh, informative. Um, the one above. Uh, do you have sales stages? Uh, I was with a group a couple of weeks ago of small business leaders, and most um, uh, didn't have formally described and measured sales sales stages. But those that did. Uh, really seem to have uh, a better grasp on the promotional activities that were working better than others uh, and, and a, a, a more focused effort to convert um, opportunities into real business uh, and to build it thereafter. So, so I think there's plenty of evidence out there that there's, there's merit in, in doing that. Um, uh, the fourth one down um, is really about you know having a plan for every customer, which is which is really good practice, and again doesn't need to be complex. Um, but but the, the format here um, across these twenty questions, uh, having evaluated the status, it gives you the opportunity to think about what to do now. Like and we we frame that as as in the next not to four weeks, things that could be done uh, over the next three months. And then the things that are perhaps a bit more strategic in nature or actually to do with uh, planning the 2021 endeavor. We've framed that as four plus months. 
Of course, that this can be adapted. You can put different time frames on it, uh, and you can choose uh, your own way of describing current status. But we're offering 20 key questions that we think uh, could really help uh, put some of the ideas of this webinar into practice for your for your business. Um, finally, before we before we turn to questions, Rich, if we can just go to the last slide. Thank you. Um, you know, communication is always incredibly important, um, almost everything some would say. Uh, but right now, if actually we do uh, take the opportunity of reflecting on our business across the four areas we've discussed and we, we do change things, uh, it is really important to, to discuss those changes with key stakeholders, whether it's uh, investors in the business, whether it's uh, partners that we need to get the support from, our team, where we need to speak clearly, openly, and, and positively. Our customers, uh, to really try and inspire them uh, over the changes we're planning to make and the benefits that they will see. And also the suppliers upon whom we're dependent. And Andy talked about the importance of working with our suppliers uh, in his section. And, and finally, and maybe perhaps most importantly, the idea that if we do change, um, uh, any of our, our practices, it is really important to set a review process in place. So whether that's weekly, monthly, quarterly, or a combination of all of those, what are the measures uh, that are really going to be most helpful to our business to evaluate whether these changes are taking effect? How frequently do we, do we assess them? And with whom do we look at our performance? So that's the final slide, uh, Rich, but Andy and I are very happy to take any questions that uh, may have come up during the session. Okay, uh, well, thank you both for uh, an excellent presentation. There were a couple of, um, well, there's been a few private messages to me as well, um, but just one that was publicly put up was um, uh, somebody who questioned actually whether going to the pub will uh, not make the boat go faster, um, in that if we're building team spirit, um, that could enhance it. I think uh, maybe it's too literal in this, this instance. I think you were giving a specific example, but. I'm guessing the point is, if it does take the right box, then that would be something that actually could help the boat go faster. I, th I think that's a great thought that we would all subscribe to. <laughs> if we can never get to the pub again. Yeah. But, 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 you, but you're, you're right, Rich. The, the, the point of the point is, is, a, is, a, is, a great, is a great thought. The point of the point is, in whatever way, you know, we need to be critically evaluating whether our actions of our own selves and our team are really helping the business. And if they're not, we should seriously challenge the worth of that activity, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are going to be some challenges ahead. I know we've got um, a webinar on Thursday talking about returning to work in a safe environment, and there's a lot of challenges um, that we know are going to come through on that webinar, um, particularly around you know, some of the things you've talked about today regarding actually not returning to an office, working in a remote environment, how do you keep the the team ethos together there's a huge amount of challenges around that particular area that i think as business leaders it's going to be really challenging to address i know it's not something we specifically talked about here but i'll throw it out anyway um so a few questions so um how do you see the role of the leader changing as a result of what's been going on michael you do that one uh, sure well i think um it's always true um that Leaders' behaviour has the biggest impact um, on employee engagement, uh, morale and performance. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess right now, you know, so many people are out of their comfort zone. So many people are adapting to new working practices. And so many people, at the suggestion of this webinar, are going to have to be on board with uh, new um, new ways of doing things, uh, new products, services to sell, new customers to work with, perhaps, and and so so I think I think the role of the leader needs needs to really think about change management uh, at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and following um, on a similar sorry, following on a similar vein, um, because you know you talk about role of the leader, but the same stage, um, how do we make sure we've got the right team on board for this journey? Because uh, you know, we've got to deliver a new plan. I think everybody's experiencing the furlough, the benefits of furlough yeah. in some respect. Um, well, that interesting. I had a conversation with a business at the weekend 
who had over 70 staff and didn't know that you could rotate your uh, furloughed staff in and out to actually be seeing their capabilities over this period of time. But how do we make sure we've got the right team? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I, think, I think on that, um, one of the, the real keys is, is to, to the, start again and actually look at roles and responsibilities uh, of our team versus the, 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 the workload that we have. And um, so often we all continue to, uh, to run at 100 miles an hour and um, cut and paste uh, what we've done in the past. But mm -hmm. I think roles and responsibilities have clearly changed um, what's, going, what's going to be happen from all of the uh, number of the points that we've spoken about in the last, uh, the last hour. So I think that is, for me, would be the starting point is what, what, what are we doing? What do we expect our staff to do? And then finally, ha have we got the capabilities of delivering um, uh, those tasks and um, that that work can be quite difficult uh, quite often in, uh, in in a very small company and uh, because we all become very close to our employees we all become um, uh, very good friends with our employees uh, the, the, but but one as a business leader it's very important we stand back and just say has has the business changed and, and what skills do we need within the business to be able to make us fit for the future and i suppose that that naturally leads into that piece around building that plan um and, and what does that process really look like in this sort of new world you know the, the plan to actually get yourself to where you need to be going as opposed to where naturally you will fall to michael uh well i think um every situation is going to be unique uh, I guess what we're trying to do here is to put forward that there are a number of areas where where change could be a benefit, and now's a great time to 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 act on that. Um, I think I think the point about planning is that you know we we tend to do the stuff that we write down and we say and we commit to, and we tend to do stuff that we measure. Um, and and so here, in, irrespective of the actions chosen by the specific business. Um, it, it is an opportunity to put structure and process into our changes and make sure that we, we take them to market effectively. And, and I think also um, uh, revisiting the business plan. Most people have business plans. Um, so some of them won't have revisited them for probably a year or 18 months. So it's a, it's a matter of um, having a very uh, cold, cold faced look at uh, the facts that sort of sit in front of us and repopulate that plan um, to ensure that uh, we can convince ourselves um, what the future really looks like and what the strategy should be. Yeah, the thing I'm hearing a lot at the moment, a lot of conversations I'm having on, is that uh, remote working is, is such a major game changer. Um, and that's potentially something that you might build into that plan. Do you yeah. agree necessarily that it's a game changer? I um, I think that it's a game changer for three three different uh, reasons. Um, one is how do you motivate your team remotely? I think that we've all been very uh, we've been very it's been very easy to call an impromptu meeting um, with a member of staff and, and sit down with a one to one with them to understand what the challenges are. Um, a lot of people very much feed off other people's um, energy, which is not going to happen now. So it's how, how do we go around motivating our team uh, remotely? So I think that's, that's, that's point one. I think point um, health and safety. So a business that um, I know really well has just had their first two complaints from people that now say that they have got back injuries from working off their kitchen bench or kitchen chair because they haven't got the right chair to be able to do their job. And they've mm -hmm. put the fir the fir the, the, their first shot across the bows for a future claim. Okay. Now, I think that's the, the start of a trend that's likely to come along. And we all need to be really clear on what does that look like. And also from working from home as well, in terms of things like cybersecurity, and how we how we want our, our teams and our business to communicate with the outside world from somebody working from home. And then the third the third point is about well that very large overhead called 
a, a head office and in a small business, those head offices obviously aren't necessarily that large, but it's still an overhead that we have that's significant within our business. Do we really need the size of head office or building that we've got uh, to see us forward? Uh, they're expensive um, things to service and they are um, usually, not always, but usually a depreciating asset rather than an appreciating asset. So is that really what we're looking to do um, forward and is that what, what, what's required? Every business will answer it differently. So that's, I think, our three, three things that um, are going to uh, be uh, on the agenda for, for businesses going forward. Part of the challenge with having any offices, um, especially if you're renting, is the length of your lease. And, uh, Very good point, yeah. And actually, that may be the issue that stops you from being able to work remotely. On, on, a, on a positive note, I was talking to a, a leader just the other day with a, with a team of people in different locations, and, and they, were, they were all incredibly positive about uh, this enforced home working because it was a great leveler. You know, those that in the past were at HQ versus those that were from the home office. The home office people felt a little bit, um, you know, externalized, less, less included, if you will. And now we're all on the same footing. And, and that particular team were very much of a mind that, that they wanted to carry on with this way of working. Not perhaps, you know, all the time, but, but as a significant way of, uh, of teaming moving forward. Yeah, and I think that that's what will come through, as I said, uh, the webinar on Thursday is very much talking about actually how you can start to move back to working in an office environment, all the, all the things you're going to have to do to ensure you're working in a safe environment. But that's hugely challenging in its own right. And if you are a business owner, I think there's, there's a lot of question marks of actually, do you ever want to get back to the office? And then there's a, then there's a question of actually, how do you get out of that lease? which is probably the next biggest question. You're going to find a lot of landlords with a lot of property sitting on their hands where actually they haven't got um, uh, any takers for renting their properties going forward. You know, you see companies like WeWork and Regis who have built a whole business around remote workers or sorry, um, desk-based workers. Um, is that, is that even going to be required going forward? Are people want to go want to go into those environments? I think there's some real big challenges ahead. Um, okay, um, probably one other point. Um, you did talk about um, competitive position, competitive position. Uh, what exactly did you mean by that? Uh, I, I think there's um, two ways to think about competitive position. Uh, the first way is quantitative. So mm -hmm. measuring our sales, our units uh, in comparison to those that compete against us to really establish a a, a numeric or share position of the market. But the second, the second way is to evaluate it from a qualitative perspective, i.e. what, how does our product or service compare to that that they offer and how do I improve my competitive advantage? So for me, there's, for me, there's two, um, two ways of thinking about this that, that could drive development actions and messaging. Okay. I suppose in a similar vein, um, USPs, um, I think you probably, as a business, I'm guessing you've probably got to relook at those because they might have changed as a result of COVID. Uh, dead, dead right. I, th I, think, I think the events of the last couple of months have, have really shaken people's perceived priorities. And, and, and therefore, it's going to be really good not to assume that things felt important in the past continue as their chief buying criteria. They may have a completely different, um, you know, a view on, on what's important now. Yeah. Um, and sorry, going back to uh, offices again, I know there's also lots of concerns by staff about getting back into a work environment. So actually staff are reluctant to get back in. Staff may have issues with um, uh, child care. They may have shielding issues, uh, stress. Uh, there's so many issues that are almost um, going to cause us to re-look at um, the environments and how we work. I think it's, there's so many challenges ahead of us. Um, it, it's been a really good talk and, and thank you very much. Uh, just want to see if there's any more questions that I haven't answered already. Um, not seeing anything more coming up in the chat as we speak. So I will move on to our final slide, uh, which is just to remind anybody that we do have other seminars coming up. 
Uh, we have one this Thursday, as I said numerous times, about returning to work safely. So that's helping businesses actually plan for returning to work and what needs to be put in place. Uh, May system, we've got speakers who actually have been working throughout this period of time. Uh, and then the following Thursday, we're giving a talk on operational efficiency and how to improve operational efficiency. And I know uh, Andy Coton and I were having a conversation, I think it was last week, regarding a supply in the food industry uh, and a really good example of actually a business that uh, has had to put in um, social distancing into work environments and how it's impacted their operational efficiency and what they realistically expect now to achieve and the impact that's going to have on everybody and everything going forward. Uh, so that's good. So you can go to the CPCA business website to book those webinars. You can also get in touch for a one-to-one -one session, which are free as I previously advised um, and supported by the uh, Kempshire and Peaceborough combined authority. Um, you can either go through the CPCA business website or email support at CPCA business And that concludes our presentation for today. I'd like to think, uh, both our speakers, uh, Andy and Michael, uh, I really appreciate your time today, guys, and uh, wish everybody all the best. Thanks very much. Good luck. Stay safe. Yep. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.